on Friday, November 15th, Netflix and Most Valuable Promotions bring you the highly anticipated heavyweight boxing mega event of the year. Jake El Gallo Paul will go toe to toe in the ring against Iron Mike Tyson, the baddest man on the planet. Don't miss this epic showdown live from AT&T Stadium in Arlington, Texas. Watch Paul vs. Tyson, Friday, November 15th at 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific, live only on Netflix. Ryan Reynolds here from Mint Mobile. With the price of just about everything going up during inflation, we thought we'd bring our prices down. So to help us, we brought in a reverse auctioneer, which is apparently a thing. Mint Mobile Unlimited Premium Wireless. How to get 30, 30, how to get 30, how to get 20, 20, 20, how to get 20, 20, how to get 15, 15, 15, 15, just 15 bucks a month? So Give it a try at mintmobile.com slash switch. $45 upfront payment equivalent to $15 per month. New customers on first three-month plan only. Taxes and fees extra. Speed slower above 40 gigabytes in detail. In this episode from the archives, I teamed up with co-host for this series we called Deliberate Practice with Andy Ryland, who was a member of my team and the senior manager of education and training at USA Football. We discussed the importance of analyzing practice drills and their effectiveness in game performance, and we emphasized evaluating our coaching methods, identifying errors, and understanding their origins, as well as examining some performance metrics. Our conversation highlighted the need for consistent terminology and focused air categorization to enhance skill development. There are many ways to improve using postseason analysis and improving technique and skill is the episode's focus. This episode is brought to you by Honda. When you test drive the new Prologue EV, there's a lot that could impress you about it. There's the class-leading passenger space, the clean, thoughtful design, and the intuitive technology. But out of everything, what you'll really love most is that it's a Honda. Visit honda.com slash EV to see offers. I'm James McComb, reporting live from home in my bathrobe and slippers. Tonight, we're talking Dunkin' Polar Peppermint Coffee. Gene's here with the latest. Uh, Gene, do you copy? The home with Dunkin' is where you want to be. Welcome to Coaching Coordinator Podcast and another episode in our series, Deliberate Practice. And joining me is our co-host for this series, Andy Ryland. Andy, good to be talking ball and practice here with you again. No doubt, Coach. Appreciate you having me on. Appreciate this conversation. Really been enjoying it so far. So looking forward to kind of getting our teeth into it a bit more. So when we left off last, and we've kind of been giving our listeners a little bit of, of homework on this. So if, if you're listening to this and you don't know exactly what we've been through before, check out the last two episodes. And this has really been running over the course. Now, this is the third episode where we're talking about being able as a position coach, whatever position you are, being able to identify certain errors and determining over the course of the season, how did this error occur? What was the function of the drills you worked in practice? Did that correlate to the game? Because we're trying to look for really, as we talk about this, uh, a deeper why. I mean, this is just a series of really why type of questions that as we go through this analysis, we're answering. Yeah. Again, we've talked about it before, right? You know, why are we doing those drill? And that's a key for our programming prescription. But another thing that we may come to realize is kind of the idea that are our drill doing what we think they're doing? So are they actually leading to quality performance. You know, what if we were to find that a drill we were doing a lot of, and let's use the stereotype, but a coach really likes it or it was a staple of his training and that it's just something that, you know, I love this drill. It's a great drill. Well, if you're doing it all the time, but at some point your statistics and your analysis says your players are, they're not demonstrating it. It might not be the why. It might be that drill is just not working for them. But unless we can look at the performance and make some big, credible judgments on what's happening, and this is where the evaluation stuff comes in, we don't really know, I guess what we're really looking at is, are we getting the transference that we need from the drill and or is our programming lopsided or balanced enough to address what we actually do? So as we're looking at this and just to kind of review the steps we've taken so far, we went through our practice plans 
And basically on a spreadsheet, we listed out everything we worked in terms of drills and basically a number of periods that we saw throughout the year. We're looking again at our individual practices here, individual periods. From there, then we went into huddle and we started looking and creating some columns where we could code some of the things on our different plays. And we talked about as we went into looking then for errors. So as we had our plays grouped, and we might pull out a certain play and this would be rep- repeated for any play or maybe a route concept. Maybe it's a coverage concept. Maybe it's a, a certain defensive front or stunt. Like you have to think about for you, what are the things that you do that make sense for you to kind of break this down and get a better picture of the effectiveness of your practices and how you might be able to do two things in this off season. Number one, create a better practice. Practice to me is the key for performance on Friday. And number two, where do you need to go get answers? Like you may go through this and find out, you know what, this happens to us all the time. And I I just don't have the best answers for it. I'm going to ask coaches about this off season. And so now it really gives you a target of things that you're going to spend your off season on to improve your team, especially in terms of what you do as a position coach. So what we're looking at next, we've taken a particular scheme. And so now let's say we are looking at power and I'm coaching the offensive line. And I'll kind of let you go through a scenario, Andy, and and give it a defensive flavor to it as well. I've labeled each particular scheme. I've labeled everything, any errors in general as a scheme error or a technique error. And now what I want to do is I want to filter all those technique errors on, again, this one particular play power. And for me, I'm going to create four columns. I guess as I'm going through this and thinking about this, remember that huddle allows you to create different templates in different columns. So you don't have to muddy up like the basic breakdown. You can create your own here and as many as you want for an analysis of your particular play. So as I'm looking at this, there's a couple ways to approach this. If I really want to get detail, I can create a template that's you know going to be specific to that particular play as I code this thing out. But Probably the best thing to do is say, okay, who who are the guys I have on the field for this particular play? And so if I was coaching the offensive line, it would be my five linemen, and I would just create a column for each of those. So just kind of go left to right, left guard, or I'm sorry, left tackle, left guard, center, right guard, right tackle, columns for them. And now I'm going to go through and look at each particular play, and I want to think about the different things that I have each of these guys do on a play that they need to be successful at and things that, again, we work on in practice. This is the skill. This is the expectation. So for example, on my down block, and you know, there could be a number of guys who have to down block on a play. I might want to look at that first step in the brace angle, right? Did we take a good brace angle on our first step, right? So I might write something if I wanted to, like first step, or if you wanted to be specific about what that step was, which I like a little bit better, I would put in then brace angle, right? That brace step. And so I know that when I go back through and I start sorting this, that if I sort a lot and get a lot of hits for brace angle, it's something that we have a problem with. We didn't get good at that for some reason. Now that's going to be some, you know, we're doing the quantitative right now to get a better picture of the why, but there's going to be some qualitative answers that you have to go through and, and think about those things too. What were we doing in practice? How do we teach this? Where is the disconnect? Why do we have a gap in performance here? And that's all we're trying to do is identify those things. Again, none of this is really to be an indictment on your coaching. It's to help make your coaching better, right? So don't be afraid to to find these things out. In fact, I would look forward to that. If I had a play that wasn't successful, the better I can understand exactly why it broke down, the more chance I have at being able to fix that and make that play something that really works out well for us. Well, I couldn't agree more with everything you've said, but I think just maybe to highlight and double down on a couple of the key points that you said that I think are are important. And I beat this one to death over the course of two years, but having that key is so important. You know, during the season, traditionally, we've always made notes for our players. You write brace angle a couple of times and you write first step a couple of times and you write aim point accidentally two or three times. It's going to make your numbers really difficult to get your head wrapped around. So I think that process of just saying, okay, what are we going to call it? Hey, we're going to call it brace angle. Okay. Then we're going to talk about our engage or, you know, we're talking about our fit. And so we just kind of come up with those big columns that you think 
maybe sequentially make up the skill that you're looking at. And that could be for obviously the offensive lineman, but the same thing for a receiver. Maybe it's their stance and then it's their release or their st- their stem and, you know, all those kind of things. But think of those big buckets that then you can evaluate as a coach and just say, okay, where did this let us, where did it let us down? So kind of as we're going through the play, what let us down? What did we not do as well as I would have liked to do? And coaches in football, you know, we talk about and so many guys are, passionate about it and you get a reputation it's a badge of honor kind of in our profession right the the film junkies but in season you know as much as we want to provide our guys quality feedback and grading you don't have the time as you do in the off season to do some of these deeper numeric dives where i'm sure you're looking at the play but taking the time to break it down numerically and find out the where did we get let down has been it's such a big help it's something we've done a lot in the tackling and I think doing it for these other positions means a ton. And then, you know, to your point too, that you can split it up amongst your coaching staff, however you guys are split up on the field. So, you know, guys now that have an interior three and then a tackle coach, or maybe that you're splitting in two groups, you have an inside and outside receivers group based on your coaching staff. Defensively, there's a, a million different ways groups are split up because of three-man fronts and four-man fronts and what we're doing with stars and nickels and and rovers, but kind of try to keep the numbers to what are the groups that are going to work together, kind of what are your individual groups that the coaches work with, and you want to evaluate each position group, each position coaches programming of their group. So if you're doing it as a staff, you know, do it that way. If you're doing it on your own as an individual coach, again, hone in on your group Don't get overcomplicated on all the other things. This is going to help you programming, you know, that 10, that 15 or that 20 minute that can make all the difference. And then the thing you said about, you know, practice is the most important thing for football specifically, right? We're unique in that we only have one game a week, unlike baseball and basketball and soccer. Those guys get to play two or three times a week. So for us, you know, we practice and play at at what, a five to one ratio. So practice really is the meat and potatoes and getting that right means so much. So yeah, you take your time with it. I think we've mentioned this before and don't worry about being overwhelmed by everything. One of the things you said that's important is keep it to one scheme at a time. So, you know, you may want to look at what's your most important scheme or what scheme did you run most? What was your bread and butter? Whether it was a gap scheme or a zone scheme, or again, looking at a passing concept, just break that one down, do it in bite sized chunks. So you really get a feel for who your guys are and how they're operating within that one scheme. We'll go back and look at the other schemes later, but let's see if we can pull apart and learn everything we can about how our guys interact with this scheme for right now. And Andy, as you're looking at this too, I think what would be valuable for you, you broke it down into scheme. Now within there, you can do a sort or group together certain things. So maybe you want to look at And I was talking about the power play. Maybe I want to look at the overfront first so that my eye is on things that are the same, right? Power against the overfront. And so it starts to allow me to see just what's in there. I mean, I want to get in the rhythm and the flow of, of looking at a particular play and seeing things and seeing the differences in certain plays to help me understand where some of those errors or where the differences are occurring. It's almost like one of those, you know, little games. What looks different in this picture? Right. Those are the kind of things that you're looking for as you start putting these plays together, start breaking it down by scheme. But again, I would organize and sort it into looking at that scheme against a particular front first, because you might find that for whatever reason, it looked better against an over front against an under front. Right. What does that tell you? And you don't have to answer that question yet. That might be some strategy that you need to look at, but there's probably some technique things in there as well, because the differences that occur in the blocks. So it might be as you go back to your chart and what did we work during the season that we worked a heck of a lot of a deuce block, but we didn't work a combo with the center and the guard looking at comboing, you know, a shade up to a backer. And so that didn't get enough work. And that's exactly what we're going for as we put this together. We're looking for the why behind it. Like if this didn't look great, if this was not up to the standard, why is that? And what can I determine from looking at my practice plan and my practice schedule 
that helps me understand that. That is such a key point. It's like a really underrated point, but the coach's eye is one of the most valuable tools that we have. And to your point, if you're always going to look at your overfronts and your underfront, but if you start lining up all of, we'll say your down block with your tackle coming down onto a three technique, and you look at those in a row, you're going to spot kind of those micro differences way easier than if you're just catching the random tackle down block you know, kind of mixed in to the whole season's worth of play. So I think it is silly as it sounds, it's hugely important to really look for that detail, that forensic detail that's going to tell the difference. I love that idea of doing it versus saying front. I know when we've done some of our, our tackle evaluation stuff where after a while, you start to, you almost get to know what tackle's coming. You get the player, you see him moving. These are guys that we don't work with on a daily basis. You're just grading a three or four game loop of their clip, but you start to see him in space in a compression situation, kind of get a feel for what's going to happen. I can't advise that enough for coaches to really learn a lot about their guys, uh, how they move and what they struggle with. And then the key for us, obviously, is to pull that back to is that in spite of or because of the training that we've done up to this point. So. Put it in a small bite-sized chunk that makes your life easy. Look at all of the things versus one front. Look at the things versus another front. Maybe you move to the third front, but keep it in those families so that your vision stays clear and it's nice and easy. Defensively, you know, same thing. We're going to look at whether it's a particular front. We're gonna, hey, we want to look at our movement. So we're going to look at all of our defensive line studs, right? And I want to look at all those in a row, right? Defensive line is a little easier. We know what our alignments and fronts are going to be, but we want to look at our movement technique. We start to get the coverages. You might want to move it by formation so that we're looking at, okay, here's what it looks like clean and pretty versus two by two. Then we start getting the three by ones and we have checks or, you know, we're playing tight ends and wings in different groups. It's going to look different. So keep it in those formation family. You get a real nice picture of what we're doing. And my guess is, and I think you'd agree, you'll start to see some patterns really quickly. Like, hey, we played this really well versus two by two and three by one, these nice clean fronts. But when we got a back to two and three in trips or we got a tight end wing or a bunch, all of a sudden it didn't quite look as pretty. And that's going to give us the big red flag we need to go look at the drill work. Did we address it or not? It's Kaylee Cuoco for Priceline. Ready to go to your happy place for a happy price? Well, why didn't you say so? Just download the Priceline app right now and save up to 60% on hotels. So whether it's Cousin Kevin's Kazoo concert in Kansas City, go Kevin! Or Becky's Bachelorette Bash in Bermuda. You never have to miss a trip ever again. So download the Priceline app today. Your savings are waiting. Go to your happy place for a happy price with Priceline's Black Friday sale. Save now and travel later with our best deals of the year. Go to your happy price. Priceline. Really, Andy, as as you get good at this and start to see the patterns and the understanding, I think the result is this. And what you'll see like next August when you hit the field again is that you're going to be really good at making adjustments. You're going to understand when something breaks down, shoot, it was this. I saw it happen. It was this. This is what he needs to do. Right. And then obviously planning the practice for next year, I think we'll start to get a little bit more definitive for you as well. You know, I think as you were talking about the defensive side, I was just talking to one of our, I won't mention him by name, but he's still in season, one of our good friends the other day and talking about making sure, you know, as they were game planning, trying to design their run fits for this particular week, how they were doing things so that they had essentially their best tackler making the play. And I thought that, wow, that's really, you know, from a defensive side, a a very interesting concept about being able to understand what the other team is doing on, on a high percentage and being able to, to put our team in the best position and have the best skill sets available to do that. I mean, you might find as you're going through this, let's say you are coaching, as an example, the safeties that maybe it was set up, the way it was set up on a particular, maybe it was a stunt or front, to, you know, alignment, the way you guys were looking at things on defense and gap responsibilities that you put your safety a high percentage of the time on a bigger back. And maybe you would want that bigger body linebacker on him on a particular thing. So you start to see like, okay, this might've been the technique here that this guy on the tackle is maybe you evaluate his tackle. He made some of these errors, but man, we really put this guy 
in this particular front as the main tackler on a lot of this. Again, patterns will develop. I mean, that's the beauty of, of football. And I do it every single week as I break down film for a high school team is getting it to the point where I can understand a thought process and what somebody is trying to do. So this, as we're talking about it, yes, this is all the technique and the skill development stuff we want to look at. But I also feel like this process is going to make you a better game planner, make you a better caller, game, you know, defense caller, or play caller on Friday or Saturday. Yeah, I'm probably throwing a softball to you because I know I've heard you say this before, but going back to that coach's eye and what you'll see next preseason, why wait to coach it up on film if you could see it in real time? And so I think it does. It helps so much just to be able to see and look at, hey, that, and then what's actually happening. And the other thing is it'll give you almost a cheat sheet where if you know that we'll say you struggle with your brace angle on down block, I guarantee you the first time you guys run that next season, you're going to be locked in on that brace angle. You know, when I was coaching at Bucknell, I used to make notes on my sheet all the time of what I wanted to look at on our practice script on the play. I'd make notes to myself, hey, you know, watch this, watch the stud and watch this, watch the fam and watch this. Because when you're creating plays to really challenge them, I wanted to look for a particular thing, not kind of get my vision so big, you lose the, the forest to the trees, and this can help. And a hundred percent, there'll be patterned stuff in there on tackling, on who's taking on the blocks, on who's getting the one-on-one matchup. And I'm sure you'll find some great schematic stuff in there. But again, the idea of what skills do my players need to get better at? You say it every week, but it's the best way to become a better football player is to become a better football player. I love the weight room. I love training just as much as anyone, but you know, getting stronger and faster isn't guaranteed to make you a better football player. If you're identifying the gaps in guys' games from a technique standpoint, they have nine months to start to work on those things and get those skills up in the off season. And that can make a world of difference, not just to our coaches programming, but imagine some of those debrief meetings, those meetings you're going to have when you come back from Christmas break or the, the holidays and the new year. You come into January, you start meeting with your returning juniors and we're saying, hey, we had a great year, junior starter for us. Here's the things that I've noticed that we need to get better at in the off season. Think about that as far as the, the power and the ownership of giving players over their own performance. So this serves multiple roles. We don't want to dil- dilute it because I know we're working on programming better individual periods, but there's just too much meat on the bone not to talk about some of the other benefits that I think you'll have as you break down, not just what happened, but why and where that breakdown happened within that particular skill for that particular scheme. That's a powerful, deep look at really high level execution that most people probably haven't done. Or if they have done, they haven't done it with the cataloging of keeping the record, but they actually have some numbers to back up that good gutting instinct. And I think, Andy, it's exactly the cataloging is going to be key here. What you will develop out of this, too, if you don't have it already, I think the people who have very specific and detailed, let's call it a system and terminology within that system, we're probably going to find it a little bit easier to grade. My suggestion in in doing this and looking at the picture the same way every time was if you don't, that you do start to code these things. And I really think you want to look for one word or two word code because We've talked about this before. When you're doing coaching cues, if you could get one word or two word coaching cues, you could coach, you know, anybody on the fly. You don't need a dissertation to make them understand it. So that should go along with these columns here. So to look ahead, I think where we're going with this next, you know, we'll give you some homework here. I know for some of you, it's going to take much longer. and, And we recommended that you do take your time on this. Don't fly through it for two reasons. One, you just finished a a lot of work during the season. So it's not about burnout. It's about your learning and developing in the off season. And two, you want to give it a detailed look, right? So you want to make sure right now at this time of the year that you can spend a little bit extra time on things as you're looking at this. So, you know, looking ahead, it is about how do we start to then look at the programming behind us, not just in season, but off season as well. And especially in terms of, you know, where contact is taught, blocking, defeating blocks, and tackling. And we've put together some incredible systems for that. And within those, I would say 
other than I think, you know, you correct me if I'm wrong, other than a few particular things where we were working on certain hand fits on a set of shoulder pads or on a player's chest in the blocking and the feeding blocks part, we have drills, tons of drills that can be used year round and done in shorts and t-shirts in the weight room. Yeah, 100%. I mean, I guess depending on the rules, if, if you're having shoulder pads as an aim point for maybe some target accuracy of, of your handwork, you know, is illegal. And I understand the state association rules for that. That's really the only thing that you can't do is work those perfect fit in relation to the shoulder pads. But all of the posture, the power, the footwork stuff, those are principles of play that you can apply year round in any real situation. It can be done on the field. It can be done in the gymnasium. It can be done in the weight room. As guys get better at it, the foot fire drill and things like that from our, our contacts, it can become great parts of your dynamic warm up just to get the guys moving and working on the kind of the skills that they're going to do. Our tackle systems are done completely in shorts and t-shirts so that players can do them year round, whether it's versus the shield, whether it's worth versus an opponent in some tracking situations, which by the way, make great reactive agility games. Uh, if you ask me and some of the grapple stuff we do, I know you've recommended supersetting some of this stuff into your weight room exercises where you're going to do a weight room exercise, and then you're going to reinforce a, a posture or a position that we're going to use on the field. Maybe we're going to do a bench press, and then we want to reinforce the, the way we keep our hands in play. We're going to do some sort of lower body power exercise, uh, you know, a big generic one that's done in the weight room. And then we're going to work some sort of hip action or lower body power action, like we're taking on or making a block or making a tackle, because those are going to be slightly nuanced as far as angles and direction, but we couple these things together to look for true player development, not just big numbers or trying to create the best football player possible. And I think the skill work is the thing that we've probably taken the most time away from, but we also talk about that it's the most critical aspect of the game, right? So it's not uncommon for some of our guys to go months without ever being able to do true skill work. And then we're going to go into spring practice or depending on our state, we have to wait all the way till summer and then try to ramp it up when we could be pulling on that thread and touching on things continuously year round and not by making it extra workout and extra stuff that again, burns you out or makes it unfun for the kids, but just by implementing it into your program seamlessly and having the kids always working on the core of their craft, which is going to be blocking, tackling, releasing from the line of scrimmage, you know, backpedaling, whatever position they play, that's the core of what we're ultimately going to ask them to do. Let's get them really good at that. Last, we'll recap. The homework for this part of it is, again, to pick out a scheme that you want to look at. We suggested going with things that are really your bread and butter first. So one that there are a lot of these to look at. Maybe it's your base coverage or front. Maybe it's your base run game, base pass concept, whatever it might be. And go through for your players. So if you're the line coach, you're looking at all five of your players. If you are the safeties coach, maybe looking just at those two guys. And you're going to go through and you're going to code. If you don't have a, a code already, it's one or two words. And looking at starting to identify those common errors. Break it down into certain phases of it. And start to see the patterns. So we aren't necessarily to the part where we've, we're putting together the report and analysis and comparing, but we'll get to that one next week. Go through and do that for your schemes. We'll pick this up and discuss more detail on it next week. No doubt. It's a, a lot of work, a lot of uh, good film watching, but again, I, I'm pretty sure the patterns will come out and a fun little exercise might be as you're doing it is start writing down some notes or some ideas, call them a hypothesis. Uh, what you think you're seeing, and then we'll, we'll check it against the numbers at the end. But I'm guessing most of our coaches will, will start to see it quick. We'll start to feel some things, and we'll already start thinking about recreating some trails before the numbers have even told the whole truth. So enjoy it. It's a fun part of the process. It's what makes us better for those of you that are in the off season. And those that are still in season, obviously, down to crunch time, good luck. Appreciate you guys, what you're doing out there in the cold up here and then on the northern parts of the country prepare for these playoff games Take some great pictures and videos from across the country of guys out there in the, the fleet the rain and the snow but that's championship football in the north and 
down south, guys. You guys are lucky. Enjoy the weather. Keep playing that good ball, and I'll be looking forward to hearing you from you next week. At Coaching Coordinator, we pledge to source the latest and greatest products and services available in the coaching marketplace. We call this repository the 10% Toolkit. These resources are proven to help coaches win games and achieve all objectives for their programs. Think of it as a buyer's guide for vendors and suppliers we trust with our seal of certification. Follow all we're doing at coachandcoordinator.com and follow us on X at Coach K. Krabowski.